Jonathan David, guys. I mean, we know we've been hearing all kinds of rumors, and we all, we ourselves have been talking for the last couple of years if he should stay at Lille, if he should move on. There's been reported interest by AC Milan, but we're also hearing that Lille has even dropped his value. A, because his contract expires, so whichever team takes him on, obviously will only have him for about 18 months when he goes in, if he were to go in that January window, but also production. I mean, guys, this is somebody who's not really starting anymore for Lil. This is somebody who put up 20-plus goals last year. What does he have? Two. I mean, are we a little bit concerned here? Um, Ollie, I'll start with you. Are we a little bit concerned here with Jonathan David's form? I don't know if I'm concerned. I, I, I just don't know. Like, I, I don't think we need to kind of, you know, um, paint a rosier picture than, than his reality. I'm, I'm not sure Jonathan David has taken that step yet, which we're all hoping he will take. And he's still got time to take it. He's 23 years old from being a really good striker to like a, a great elite one in a, a, at the top European level. Because I, I think on the surface, you maybe think he took that step last season. He's got 24 goals in Liga and he's right up there comparable with, with Mbappe and, uh, and, and Balogun mm-hmm. and the top players in, in the French league. But he scored 10 penalties. Like we, we can't escape that. I, penalties are important and they're not easy to take and it's not nothing. But his his goal scoring total when you take the penalties out in, in in the past three seasons now it's been 13 13 and 14 so that that jump to being a player who can score 18 19 20 goals from open play hasn't quite happened and so that when you go through a stretch like this where Lil had the most penalties in league on last season they had they received 12 penalties this season they haven't received a single penalty and the penalties are suddenly out of the equation for Lil and we know that can happen in football you suddenly become vulnerable to, to what looks like a bit of a drought, right? And, and it's four goals in 16 games in all competitions for mm. Jonathan David. So that to me is, is just that next step in his game that if you're going to go to one of the top clubs, if you're going to get the the asking price, which apparently now isn't the asking price, but, but was over the summer, you've got to show a little bit more than he has. That doesn't mean I don't love him as a player and think he's a fantastic player. It just means there is that next step there that I don't think he's quite taken yet. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling about it, Jordan? Yeah, there are dips in, in form. It happens, right? Scoring is the hardest thing to do in football, and this happens to every single striker. Granted, some get over it a bit quicker, right? Maybe go five, six games, they don't score a goal or whatever it is, and then they come back with a hat trick and then all's forgotten. But with him, I agree with Ollie. I think he just has to stay the course. I think also, too, in football for a striker, it's all it's about timing is everything. Like when you move on to a club, I felt like it should have been at the end of the – uh, the summer he had a best season it's like you can only almost go downhill <laughs> at Lille. Yeah. it's like he had such a great year this is maybe the time to move but class is permanent he has the quality he if he puts himself in that window and he keeps training hard he'll have his move like he's a he's a top tier striker he just has to stay the course and and, and stick with it I mean, I mean, his club form is one story here, but I think it's completely separate from him playing for the national team. Remember, he only had three goals in his final 19 games to finish up the 2022 season. That's when he was also playing for Canada and doing so well. And he responded by scoring 26 goals in all competitions last year, guys. So, I mean, for, for, for some top goal scorers like in, in strikers like Jonathan David, it comes in ebbs and flows, but he always shows up for Canada. His goal scoring record sure. is incredible. He's scored three and five with two assists in 2023 playing for Canada. And he leads the line being able to press as well. I I, I, I have no doubt he's going to show up. He is honestly the least of my concerns when it comes to this Canadian team. Okay. So we're feeling good about Jonathan David. How are we feeling about Mauro Biello, Jordan? We know that this is once again, just to reiterate Canada soccer. um, They're going to, Oh, sorry. There's just ginger walking by there. Uh, (laughs) Canada soccer, they're going to let him play out the the end of the year here, which really are these two games, trying to get them into Copa America. We know that by the end of the year, they would really like a new general secretary in place, and they're going to leave it up to that person to make the hiring decision for a manager. We also know that Mauro Biello, he's on record. He's made it perfectly clear. I want this job. So, Jordan, how much pressure is on him to get things right? I mean, I can't imagine what's going through his head, because even as a manager – you know, there's a lot that you can control from tactics and personnel, but then you've just got to sit there and pray that the players get it done for you or else it really blows up in your face. Yeah, and I think the two things I want to mention, the first one is the players that Mario Biello brought back in, right? I think if you have a short window like he has to really show what you can do, I think you have to ride and die with the players that you trust. So you're seeing guys like Mark Anthony K come back in, uh, Cavallini as well. These are guys that he knows, right? And he's been to camp with, been to Qatar with, like, these are these are his tried and true 
football players always talk about, hey, this is going to be your one opportunity. This is just your one shot to make it. For Mar Biela as as head coach, this is it. Like, this is that dress rehearsal. This is that time. Like, it's all these games leading up to it. Everything that he does is on, on a mic. You're looking through a magnifying glass and you're seeing what he's doing. Um, hence why I feel like he's going with the, the guys he feels comfortable with. But pressure, I mean, I think he has to just go about and, and continue doing what he's doing. You don't have to do anything extra. You just have to make sure you get the job done. And I think the approach with going that with guys that you know is probably the right one because I don't think this is mm-hmm. the time to switch things up. And I, I guess that goes back to you've been saying it and also, Wheels, you've been saying it as well when we look at this roster, some of the names that have been called back in. Um, like you said, the Mark Anthony K, Lucas Cavallini, younger players who have been, you know, left out, but Ali Ahmed getting the call back in. Like when you look at just even this roster, your impressions of it, what does that even tell you about what Biello is trying to accomplish? Yeah, it, it, it's got to be pragmatic. Look, it's, I don't think it's um, it's a no-win situation for Biello here. He has to get this team through. And even if he does... Whether he's hired on as a permanent head coach is completely out of his hands. A general secretary will be hired first and then a coach. And whoever they hire, depending on their qualifications and their standard and their connections, they might have a preference in terms of what direction they want to take the board or take to the board. So even if he does win, there's no guarantee here. So this is less about Moro Biello and him doing the best he can to see this team through these, these next two games. And I think a key ingredient for, I mean, we can split hairs over tactics, what formation they can play. The thing that was a little bit concerning to me in that Japan game, more so than being outclass, like Japan's an exceptional side. They didn't really look together, did they? Yeah. Just the, the body mm-hmm. language, just it was that sort of thing that really surprised me. Like the group was so good because they came together. I know it was cliche and it got a little bit much after a while, but the brotherhood, but all these things are, are what made the team um, that much better and, and potentially punching above their weight. And I think that it's going to be a real test here over these two legs, whether they can come together as a unit. I, I know, I know it's not a sexy answer, but I think these are the things that matter in two games like this. You're going down to Jamaica, a place that you haven't won in your last seven trips down there. You haven't won a game in Jamaica since 1988. Uh, it's going to be really, really tough. And they're playing a team that will probably have five Premier League players on decent form playing in that team. So it's going to be real difficult. So the team is going to have to stay together and we'll see how unifi- unified the group is. That to me is kind of the big storyline and the big challenge for, for Canada in Kingston in particular is, is we can talk about player selection and tactics all we want. But for me yeah. going down there and just getting a result, it's about the resilience of the group, the character, the willingness to fight for each other. And, and and just grind out a result, whatever it looks like, right? Is this does this team still have the spirit and, and the metal to do that? I very much hope they do. Um, but going away from home in Concacaf to, to a place like this, I think it's about those qualities as much as it is, you know, th- three five twos and, and four four twos or whatever we want to talk about here. Mm-hmm. Uh, final thought on this roster, gentlemen. Uh, any omissions or additions that just stand out to you, Jordan? I'm glad that Ali Ahmed's back in the in the mix. I think he's been a standout. I think we can all agree on, on that. I think a lot of his rise is okay. Don't don't shoot me, but in terms of the, how quickly Tejan Buchanan like burst into the scene, like Ali Ahmed as well. Like he he was grinding for a long time, but was unnoticed, and then really had a good season, and now is in the mix. And you're, you're getting you're reaping the rewards. And a lot of kids at home are probably looking at him and be like, oh. Well, all you need is a really good season. This is a guy that was busting his tail for so long, right? And was unnoticed, had to do so much. And if you really want to ask him, look at his story. It's crazy the stuff that he was doing. Moved across country, and then now he's getting that opportunity, really staying in the in the shop window in the mix, and, and knocking on that door. And the, last year was player of the year for Academy, but now moves into the first team and, and is doing well. And he's only going to get better because he's going to be playing with better players for Canada. And you're seeing him at the Gold Cup. He was a standout for sure. So I'm glad he's in the mix. Um, and I think he'll do great when he, whether he's subbed on or whether he starts. He's such a phenomenal player. But also the versatility that he brings just suits uh, Canada's lineup. What about for you, Ali? Well, I agree on Ali Ahmed for, for sure. And the other one we haven't talked about is, is Mark Anthony Kay. And he, mm-hmm. he's playing regularly for New England. Um, their season is still going, which is an advantage, obviously, <laughs> over some of the M- MLS players. Uh, I don't think he's played his way back to his best quite yet, but I do think there was going to come a point where you have to try with Mark Anthony Kay because there is a player there uh, and it's a it's a position that is still 
as we've talked about, uh, a position of need for Canada in, in terms of real natural central midfielders who can play with Eustachio. That partnership was so good for a period of time uh, in 2021. Um, like I said, I don't think Kay is quite back to that level. So we'll we'll see how what his level of involvement is in, in, in this tie. But I do think at some point uh, a, a coach was going to have to open the door for him, give him that opportunity and, and see if he can take it and turn this around going into 2024 now. He's, you know, he's out of maybe the spotlight of Toronto a little bit. He's playing for what should be a good New England team going forwards. Uh, let's see if he can take the, the, the chance he's been given here and, and, and become a more permanent fixture again in this Canada team. I think it speaks to the fact that all of the midfield, even after the three substitutions were made against Japan, nowhere near enough legs in, the, in that yeah. group. They were ran Agreed. through and around in that game. And Kay brings a little bit more pace, a little bit more athleticism, as is Ali Ahmed. Like, I can make the case for either one of them going out and starting a- against Jamaica quite easily. I think that that was completely necessary. You stack you the tactician. You need more legs in that area, and that's what those players provide. Schwanier comes out. I know that he has a lot of fans in this country, but he hasn't played since October 21st. The TFC and CF Montreal players are at a disadvantage there. That's why Osorio Piet, I'd be surprised if either of them actually come in and start these games. And I already mentioned his name, but Luke de Fougerel, I just think he's a player that you need to consider starting here. I, I think that it would be an absolute starting. starting. I, I I watched the entire game against uh, Ipswich Town in the Carabao Cup. Now, Ipswich Town are top of the league championship right now. They made 11 changes to their team. So it wasn't their, their strongest outfit that he played in the Carabao Cup. But this 18-year-old, comfortable on the ball, fluid in, trans, in, 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 in possession, he was excellent. He was standout in that game. He's making a Premier League team every week. Like he's making the 18 like every week for a very good coach under Marco Silva. I don't think he's just handing out things. I know they have a couple injuries at the back, but uh, when you look at him, you see that he's a little bit of a different gravy. He brings something different than some of these other Canadian okay. center backs. I know he's young. Are you willing to roll the dice? I think that in a game like this, he could maybe only play in a three. I'm not sure if you want to do it in a two, but maybe he can. Maybe he's better than what Canada has. That's the name I circle. I want him cap tied because I think he has a very bright future. Is the time now? I think I can make the case that it is.